Yeah, good evening, everyone. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Doug Deering. I'm grateful for my desire to stay sober. And uh, Karen, thank you uh, for asking me. Um, you know, I always consider it an honor and a privilege when asked to do anything in AA. I think I started feeling that way when they asked me to clean the ashtrays. And, and uh, so I got away. I, I did that. Um, that was pretty much the way I started when I first got here. I didn't want to be here, but, but um, they got me real busy. And I'm grateful today that they did get me that busy because I needed to, I needed to be busy with this mind to mind, the way it was thinking at the time. And uh, so anyways, uh, I'm from Detroit originally. And uh, I grew up there. Uh, and I came from a middle class family. My dad worked for Ford Motor Company. He started there when he was around 52 or something like that. And had very little education and rose up to uh, head of security for Fords at the Sterling plant. And uh, I used to get to go to work with them on the weekends. And, and I learned how to drive there when I was real young and do things like that. And I really loved to go to work with them. Uh, but I started having problems before I drank. Um, I started having problems in school and they didn't know what to do with me because I was reading, I was reading upside down and backwards and they just couldn't figure out what was going on. And uh, they tried to get me help in a lot of different ways and, uh, and nobody knew what to do with somebody like that, that back then. Um, as time went on, they finally, had an idea they they got a name for it it was called dyslexia but um it seemed like i just it got harder and harder for me uh i wanted to learn how to play a trumpet and i and i got pretty good at it just playing myself and but there again i couldn't read the music and so i wasn't able to continue on with that and, and i've often regretted that um I hang around with a bunch of musicians. My cousins are all musicians, and I wonder if maybe I could read music today because I've, I've overcome a lot of that over the years. But as a result of it, I was kicked out of this school and that school and this school and that school. And of course, I I was frustrated and rebellious and, and, and couldn't understand what was wrong. And I started hanging out with kids that were older than me and they were getting in trouble. And so I started getting in trouble just like them at an early age. I think I was probably labeled a juvenile delinquent by the time I was eight. And and I started, uh, I meant, uh, I found out about that intervention thing through the Detroit Police Department when I was about eight. I'd skip school and stayed gone for a couple of days and everybody was a nervous wreck and they sent some cops over there into my house and you know i'm eight years old and these guys look like giants i'm looking up hurt my neck to look at them they were so tall it seemed like and you know they'd read me the riot act which i was was used to that everybody was always hollering at me like what's wrong with you and i just say i don't know sort of like alcoholics do that all their drinking years What's wrong with you? Why don't you drink like a gentleman? Uh, why don't you stop? Or why don't you cut back? Why do you do that? I don't know. And I didn't know. And so it went on. Um, I got in some problems and they were ready to send me to a juvenile detention for the, from the time I was around 10 or 11, 10, I think 11, till I was 18. Only there was an option if my dad could find a way to send me to a, a, a private school, they'd accept that. And, and he decided he found a way to send me to a military school down in Virginia. And here I'm a 
a city boy from Detroit, and all of a sudden I'm in the mountains of Virginia, and these people are speaking a foreign language down there. I don't know what they're saying half the time. They're talking about, oh, go over yonder and get this. Well, I never could find over yonder. I never, and then I'd ask the man, well, how far is, in the, is it from here to town? Oh, just a piece. Well, how far is a piece? They never could tell me how far a piece was or where over yonder was. <laughs> it was but I uh, I ended up there. I, I hooked up with a kid there. I found out that uh, I wasn't there very long when I found out that there were usually two types of kids there. There were very extremely wealthy kids that their parents either didn't want them, didn't have time for them, or just sent them there. I mean, we had Sheik's kids there and wealthy kids from all over the world. and 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 then there was the juvenile delinquents like me. And the one guy I got hooked up with, he wasn't either one of them, really. It turned out uh, his aunt had a car, and, and he could drive it. He was 15 at the time, and I was 11, 11 and a half, maybe. And we got this car, and uh, we seen a cadet we didn't like, and he was bragging about how good he could drive. I said, see if you can bump into him. And he bumped into him, and he spun around and broke his leg, and so we ended up running away from school and I got all my clothes and everything I got. I, I don't know. I'm at all 11 years old. We're out there hitchhiking and uh, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's going on, but we got to get away from there. We went to his dad's and, and I'm thinking all along, this kid's from the South. He's probably from one of them rich, rich families and they got a plantation and maybe they got some horses. I love horses. And it would be nice once I get there. And uh, it didn't turn out that way. They had this old tumble down shack was unlivable that they were trying to repair. Or I don't know what they were doing. And his dad was living in this little like, I don't know, maybe a 15 foot trailer or some darn thing. And he opened the door and a shotgun came out the door. And I, my, I couldn't believe it. And he's, I turned around and he said, y'all boys better get back to school. And he fired it. And I was down the road and it took him about a mile and a half to stop me, I think. I said, what are we going to do now? He said, well, we'll go to my aunt's. And we started hitchhiking and we got a ride. The guy's going along. He says, stop here, stop. We got to get out here. We're in the middle of nowhere. It's dark. We're in the middle of nowhere. And he stops and we get out and we start walking. I said, well, how uh, how far is it? Oh, just a piece. Oh, geez. So we hike and we're going through these mountains and he pulled out this big knife. I don't know where he got it from. I said, what are you going to do with that? He says, well, there's mountain lions up in here. I said, oh, geez, let's walk a little faster. And we got to this tumbling down shack. I mean, it looked like the Beverly Hillbillies. It had burlap flying out of the windows there was no glass in the windows it was it was wasn't good i started across the front porch he said don't go up there as we'll fall down you've got to go around to the back there's a new one we went around there and walked in and there was five kids a mother an uncle and grandpa who was 103 i think he had his bib overhauls wrapped around the iron and it was sitting on top of the stove to get it warm to go to bed. I'm saying, oh man, this is not good. What, what am I going to, what have I gotten myself into? And the uncle looks me up and down and says, boy, he, I'm glad y'all boys came along. We sure could use Doug there. He, you know, Gertrude dried a few weeks ago and uh, we don't know what we're going to do. I said, where's Gertrude? He said, well, that was our mule. I said, what do you mean, use me? Well, they tied a rope around my waist and a chain on a log, and I pulled the logs down off the mountain. And then they cut them up. I said, oh, from sun up to sundown. And I did that for about a year and a half, and I lived back there with them people. They had another side business going. It smelled bad once I got around it, but once I tasted it, it really was good. They made some some moonshine up there in the mountains, and they sold it, but they seemed to like store-bought whiskey better than their moonshine. I never could figure that out. 
I just reminded myself of that. I'm drinking some water out of a mason jar glass. That's what they had it in all the time, was a mason jar glass. But I, I lasted up there for about a year and a half, and I called my dad. I, I, I can't live like this anymore. I can't. And he came down and got me, and he didn't yell at me or nothing. He was pretty calm about it. And uh, he said, uh, he said, uh, we're going to go down to Florida on a vacation and and take a little time off. And he took me down to Florida and he let me drive his car on Daytona Beach. And I did all that. And then we started coming home and coming home. He started to, to say some things which were unusual for him. He said, I know you smoke and it's OK. As long as you smoke your own, don't be taking none of mine or asking for any either. Oh, this is, and if you're going to come live with us, you're going to need to get a job and go to work. I said, oh, and then you're going to need to pay rent from what you make going to work. So I started doing that. I was about 12 and a half then or right around that age. And I went to work, but they found a way to get me out of school if I went to this tutor three times a week. And I went there three times a week for about, I don't know, two or three years. And then they finally released me from school. But while I was in that military school, I went there. I think I was in the, I think I was in the fifth grade. And I wasn't doing that good, but they wanted to move me where I'd be with kids more my own size because they had me playing on a football team. They didn't have a lot enough kids to play in the team, so they put me on the varsity team. And I was in the fifth grade. So they moved me up to the sixth or seventh grade. Didn't make any difference. I couldn't do the work anyways. And and I uh, I ended up doing that. But, you know, I got in trouble there. I stole the I stole the, what the heck, he was the sergeant or a, a first lieutenant or something. I stole all his brass collar, brass stuff, and he was the drill instructor, and and, and he had a big sword that he wore, and the, the drill master, and I stole that and his white hat. I stole all that, and I went home for Christmas. I did get to go home for Christmas. I stepped down off there looking like I just graduated from West Point or something. <laughs> Hey, it was it was something. Uh, but, you know, I started working and I I went to work washing dishes for 50 cents an hour, about 12, 14 hours a day. And I did that and I did other jobs and uh, stayed around the restaurant business. I ended up learning how to tend bar when I was 18. Uh, a buddy of mine got me a job and I went down to the bar and, and and he was showing me around and all of a sudden he said, I got to go. I got another job. I said, well, wait, man, he just left me there and the place filled up and he handed me a book, a bar Bible. And I'm trying to thumb through these things, figuring out how to make these drinks. And the waitresses are laughing. They're teaching me how to make them. And Every drink, I, I said, how much is that? 50 cents, 50 cents. <laughs> Every drink was 50 cents. Uh, it was it was wild. But, you know, I did a lot of things like that. And along the way, I, uh, I started running away from home. I think the first time I ran away was about eight. I don't know why it wasn't my family or anything. I just wanted to go places. I wanted to see things. My mother used to call me a wandering Jew. Because I was always wandering around somewhere I shouldn't be. But the trouble I had running away is I wanted to go to California, but I don't know how the heck it happened every time I got stuck in Toledo, Ohio. Three times I got stuck in Toledo, Ohio in the ju juvenile detention. I said, God darn, I'm not running away no more. But I've sort of been that way. I've been a traveler uh, most of my life uh, I started traveling because I was getting DUIs and I needed to leave the state. <laughs> Why I started traveling. And I went from state to state to state, from jail to jail to jail. Uh, I got drunk the first time at the age of 10 on some homemade wine. 
Um, and I, it did something for me. It finally made me feel all right with myself for the first time in those 10 years of my life. I felt all right. And I searched that feeling from then on just to be okay, to, to, to try to fit in and try to cope with life. And, and I couldn't. Uh, 22, I, I was in a, in a mental hospital. Uh, my sister worked at. She talked me into going there. Some of you folks might relate with this. Uh, the one doctor said to me, he said, what seems to be your problem? I said, well, I don't have any problems. I, I said, it's the rest of the world's all screwed up. If they just get off my back and leave me alone, I'd be all right. Oh, he says, uh-huh. And he wrote something down and he said, uh-huh. And he was sucking on a pipe looking over his glasses. And he wants me to see another doctor. So I left this other doctor. I go to this other doctor and he asked me the same question. I said, did you guys miss a class or something? What happened? He laughed. He said, no. He said, what seems to be the problem? I told him the same thing. He said, he said the same thing. I want you to see another doctor. Now, I don't know what they're doing, but something's up. So I go to the third guy and he asked the same question and only he didn't say, uh-huh, uh-huh, and write something down. He said to me, we'd like you, he said, uh, he talked to these other doctors. He said, we'd like you to stay with us for a while. I said, I'm not, there you no, forget it. And I started to get up and walk out and it was like he pushed a button under his desk in a movie. And these three apes showed up with this funny sport coat my arms were crossed in front of me like that. And they fit me up with this sport coat and said, we're going to your room. I said, I'm not going to know. And they picked me up and carried me up to the third floor, wherever it was, and gave me my own private room. No furniture, just pads on the wall and pad on the floor, some bars on the window. And there I'm at in there and thinking, that, and there was a little window in the door, the big steel door when it slammed shut. It was just like a jail door. It was like, oh, man, that's a terrible sound to hear, that jail cell door. Anyway, and the guy would go by every half hour and look in, and I'd spit at him. Like, you know, and I didn't know what the heck. I was in there, I don't know, three, four, five days, whatever it was. And uh, I finally got out of there. And um, I, once I got out of there, uh, I was wondering, how in the heck did I get into this mess? I mean, I got into more things I didn't know how I got into. And I said, how did I get into this mess? And one of, I, I can't ask the nurse. She's not going to tell me. This guy was drumming with his fingers on a table. And he was drumming. He said, how you doing, kid? I said, I'm not too good. Said, What's the matter? I says, I, I don't know how I got into this mess. He says, I do. And he didn't quit drumming. He just kept drumming on there. I said, you do? He said, yeah. I said, well, how? He said, you told him nothing was wrong with you, didn't you? I said, yeah. He said, well, so did all of us. I said, oh, geez, how am I going to get out of this mess? He said, you got to get well. I mean, you got to get sick real quick. Well, I got sick real quick. They were giving me pills and this and that, and I was putting them under my tongue and spitting them out, and it was it was something. Anyways, I I got into an open ward after I'd be ever after I, I uh, I got elected to ward president. Anyways, I was I got I got there, and the next thing I know, I was on an open ward. The only reason I wanted on an open ward, I was watching people walked around walked around every day outside and i thought huh i'm thinking i could still think pretty good and i knew something happened every day at one o'clock at the end of that block and you could go down there and you could get all this stuff for free and that was called stroh's brewery so every day i go walking around i go down to stroh's i go in after a few few days the guys gave me my own copper mug. I'd go in, hi, Doug. Hey, hi, how you doing? I'd get a load on. I'd go skipping back to the hospital. I'd make a couple baskets or whatever they wanted me to do. And I was happy. 
you could have just left me there. It was just fine. I didn't have to cope with life or nothing. But the day came they wanted me to leave. And when I left, they never said anything about my drinking. They said I had a nervous breakdown, whatever that meant. And and anyways, I I uh, I went there and uh, people still on my back. You got to watch your drinking. You this you ought to go to AA. Well, I get them off my back. I go to AA, and I thought I'm gonna go into the nastiest part of town I can find. I wasn't afraid to go anywhere back then. I'm drunk all the time. I I I didn't care about nothing really. And I go to this one and I go in there and there's pimps and hookers and ex-convicts and iron workers. And I mean, there was some bad people in there and street ladies and all this and that. And I'm in there and they started telling their stories. And I'm thinking, Jesus, these people are really whacked out. Holy my God, if I ever get this bad, I might need this AA thing, but it ain't for me. I'm getting out of here. And I, I went to maybe two meetings there. Then I thought, well, maybe I didn't give it a fair try. I'll go out where the rich people go. So I went there and, you know, I developed this, this, this passion for women's fur coats. I don't know what it was. I was always hoping to find a mink. I wanted to feel what a mink fur coat felt like. I'd be on the streetcars rubbing on ladies' fur coats saying to my mom, is that a mink? Is no, that ain't a mink. Well, I go to this big church out there, and here's these. I got right next to a lady. Back then, the fashion was they all had purple hair for some reason. I don't know if it was the water or the shampoo or what, but they had purple hair. And here she is in her big fur coat, and a diamond ring, I, oh, geez, I wanted to take a bite of that. I mean, it was, it was a big carrot ring. It was big. And I'm rubbing on her coat. I'm thinking, I don't think that's mink, but it could be fox. I don't know what it was. Anyways, this little old lady leans over to me. After I listen to these rich people's stories, they're more whacked out than the ones downtown. I thought, Jesus, this and this little old lady had the audacity to say to me, I'm 22 years old and I'm sitting with all these people that are blue hair and gray hair and older and I'm 22. And, and, and she says to me, welcome home, Sonny. I said, what? She said, welcome home. I said, this ain't no home to me, lady. I'm getting out of here. And I left AA not to darken the doors for the next 20 years. And that next 20 years took me a lot of places that I didn't want to go. But it took me a lot of places I had a lot of fun. You know, I don't want to say it was all doom and gloom. I had a lot of fun. I mean, I had a lot of fun. And, and I did a lot of crazy things. I ended up on Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. And I ended up in Las Vegas as a pool boy and a shill and, and and doing stuff there in Vegas. And I ended up here and there and just all over California. And, and so I had a lot of fun, but everywhere I went, trouble followed me. No matter where I went, it was always another DUI, another this, another that, and another wrecked car. Uh, I wrecked a car in a blackout. The car was in the garage. I needed a fender and a hood. And I got the fender and the hood and I got them on there. And the lady I was living with, she went out to lunch and I went, I left, I left town and I don't know where I was going, but I got out of there and I ended up in Vegas again, lost the car, lost everything there. And so th those things just kept going on and on and on. Um, I ended up back in Michigan had another DUI there, then went to New Orleans, had a DUI there, and uh, got in a bad fight there, and, and somebody was hurt real bad, and so I had to leave there, and I ended up in in uh, Georgia, outside of Atlanta, on my friend's couch. He was going to school there to be a, a doctor, and uh, anyways, I, I stayed there with him for about three years, and I rode that couch from Florida from Georgia to Florida. And here I am now, I'm, I'm caught my first DUI in Florida, but I'm 42. 
and I'm looking at going to prison for 10 years. And I, I just, I tried to drink on Thanksgiving and I couldn't get drunk. I couldn't get drunk. I just kept drinking and I couldn't get drunk. I could, I just said, you know, I kept hearing the song in my head, the party's over and it was, and I quit. I, I said, I, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do it. And so I started, I think I was going to find a loophole to get out of the legal problems. I thought I'd get the preacher to go to court with me, and I did that. And then I came to AA only to get out of the house. I didn't come to AA to quit drinking. I came to get out of the house. I was under house arrest. And I stayed for about 90 days, and I ended up with a probation violation and thrown back in jail. For 90 for 41 days i was looking at it going away for 10 years and some old timers got in a big book to me and i mentioned i didn't read very well but you know i was clever enough to know that any answers i wanted would be in the back of that book why would they put them in the front nobody'd read the rest of the book i thought but for some reason i started reading the front of it in the front and I had a question up to that point. What's the matter with me? Why do I keep doing what I'm doing? Why do when I get up so sick, I don't want to drink, I end up drunk at the end of the day? Why do when I promise my mom and my dad and my wife and my sister and me and everybody else, I'm never going to do this again, I turn right around and do it? Not knowing I couldn't make a promise like that. Just like Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob made to their wives over and over, not knowing they couldn't make a promise like that because they were incapable of not making a promise like that. And so I'm sitting in there and I start reading this doctor's opinion and I get the answer to my problem. I have an allergy. Then it then talks more about a disease where it's a disease of the body and the mind. I had enough trouble going on with my mind. I didn't need any more troubles, but I did. And I started learning that. And when I learned that and read it in there, one guy came over to me and said, Doug, you always got your head in that book. What are you reading all the time? He said, you can't put that thing down. I said, no, I, I never read a book in my life. That's the first book I ever read in my life when I was 42 years old. And I sat and did it. And he said, what are you reading all the time? I said, well, I think I got a disease. And he jumped back. He said, oh, no. He said, what's the matter? What's wrong with you, Doug? And he jumped back about five feet. I said, I think I'm, I'm an alcoholic. R Why do you say that? I said, because of what it says here. And he says, well, what does it say there? And I started fumbling around, telling him, trying to read it and explain it, what it thought to, meant to me. And all of a sudden, he says, oh, no, oh, oh, geez, this, oh, no. I said, what's the matter? He said, I think I'm one, too. We had 16 animals in that cage. And within the next two weeks, 14 of them all decided that they had the same problem that I had. We started having a meeting in the jail cell every day. And then we did it on what I'd learned had heard in 90 days and by having this book. One man went away for 25 years. I never forget it. He was crying when he left. He said, Doug, I know I'm going to be okay because I found AA. I know I asked around that there, there's meetings in prison, Stephen. I said, yes, there is. And I, I heard from him about 10 years later, somehow somebody, I don't remember how it happened, he stayed sober in prison 10 years. So, you know, all these things were going on. Um, I I didn't want to, I did the one, two, three shuffle uh, when I came in, because when I came in, they were really into fellowship, 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 fellowship. They didn't talk a lot about the steps and this and that, fellowship, fellowship. And I was fellowshipping and I became a head guru and I started a, meeting and it exploded and got big and 
you know, I hit my missionary stage at three years. That's when you know everything and you can't wait to tell everybody. And I was running around and all of a sudden the wheels were coming off at four years and I was scared. And a man came up to me and he said, Doug, you want to drink again? I said, no. And he said, I believe you are. I said, why do you say that? He said, because it says it here in this book. If you don't do this four step there's a good chance you're going to drink again he said do you want to and i said no i don't want to drink again he said well come on with me and he took me home he pulled out a legal pad he drew three lines down it he said this column's for resentments this is others of cause and effects and i'll be back in an hour you should be done i said whoa hold up skippy don't rush into this thing here i'd been four years screwing around with this thing and he came back and he looked at what i'd scribbled down now along with writing not what reading very well i didn't write very well or spell very well that was my cop out but i scribbled the best i could and he looked at it and he said well let's talk about it i don't know what the guy's leading me into but he led me right into a fifth step right into it and we talked about it and talked about some other things he said well you did good your first time and from there on, I went on and I read some more and I remembered hearing it, that some of us go in for an annual house cleaning. And I thought, that's a good idea. A business takes an inventory every year. Why don't I? So I did that for several years and then I'd get away from it. And then I'd go back and do it again at a retreat or this or that. And I, and I did those things, you know, and I went on and did the fifth step and then went on to the sixth and seventh. And I, I was surprised how much I learned on the sixth and seventh that wasn't in the big book. The big book has what, one sentence and then the seventh step has the prayer. That's about it. But you go into the 12 and 12 where Bill wrote it 13 years later, it's funny how much more they learned in those 13 years, how much more he realized that we needed more information. And he wrote those 13 uh, and he wrote the 12 and 12. So I've, I've been to those. I go to two big book studies a week on Zoom now. One's in L.A. and the other one's in Austin, Texas. I try to make Texas pretty regular, but California I've done for the last four years. If anybody's looking for a great big book study, it's been going on 38 years. Three brothers started it. Actually, two brothers. There's five of them, and four of them are in the program. They started it 38 years ago. We just started it. We're in the forewords. And, you know, I hadn't read the forewords for a long time. And it's amazing the information that's in there, the history that's in there of how we started and where we grew, especially in 1941. We were about 2,000 strong in 1941 when Jack Alexander wrote the story for the Saturday Evening Post. And we exploded by the end of March. We went from 2,000 to 8,000. I think that's remarkable. But when you read these forwards and you think, this started with two men that had a common problem, that talked to one another, and they both understood one another. They said, Dr. Bob said, this guy knows what he's talking about. He'd talked to a lot of people about not drinking and the Oxford group, and other places. But when he talked to Bill, he knew Bill knew what he was talking about. And Bill knew that he knew he found somebody that was listening to him finally, because Bill had been practicing. He practiced on about 40, and he was ready to give up, and he went home and told Lois, I don't know what to do, Lois. He said, none of them are staying sober or nothing. She was so upset, she threw a shoe at him. She said, you damn fool. She said, you stayed sober. He said, oh, that didn't even dawn on me. You know, so this program for me is, is exactly what they offered me. And it's what, it's what uh, enticed me to stay here. When they were handing out those chips, they said, this one is for somebody that wants to start a new way of life. My life was bankrupt in every area. I wanted a new way of life. I didn't want to live the way I was living anymore. 
and they have proved it so right over and over and over again over the year. You know, I've sat in meetings. I've heard so many horrendous stories, people's health failing them, people losing family members, losing kids, losing jobs, losing their health, losing their money, losing their homes. And they all said, and I didn't have to drink. Wow. When you think for thousands of years, people like us couldn't do that. And today, here we are. Look at this Hollywood Squares. We got 100 people here tonight. That's a long ways from them two guys sitting at a little table on Ardmore Street in Akron, Ohio, having their morning coffee and their meditation. And then, then uh, Ann Smith came and had it with them. You know, and she'd always at the end say, faith without works is dead. And I found that so true. I found I haven't been lied to yet since I've been here. If I was today, I don't think I'd believe it because I know I've witnessed, you know, I can read all the books. I can study all I want, but all I have to do is look around. And how can I deny that? This isn't going to work for me or anybody else if they really want it. And thanks for letting me share with you tonight, Karen. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm glad you asked me at the last minute because I didn't have time to get nervous. <laughs> thank you.